Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another International Manifesto group webinar, this time on the Communist Manifesto at 175. My name is Radhika Desai. I'm the convener of the International Manifesto group and will be your moderator today. As the Communist Manifesto turns 175 years old, the world could not be riper for the revolution that it predicted and called for. The contradictions of a senile, ailing and decaying capitalism are maturing alarmingly into a putrescence of sharpening economic crisis and want, deepening public health and ecological emergencies, social division, political breakdown, and above all, war and nuclear war. While this is making the manifesto more relevant than ever, many still hurl the question at us. If Marx and Engels were so smart, if the communist manifesto was so penetrating, how come the revolution they predicted and called for has yet to occur? The answer lies in the actually occurring revolutions of Eastern Europe, uh, revolutions, Eastern revolutions and non-European revolutions. However, we can only read that answer when we dispense with the lenses of Eurocentric Western Marxism, which distort text as well as history. Um, uh, these lens, through the, 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 what we see through these lenses claims that Marx was wrong, Marx and Engels were wrong in critical ways. They were wrong to analyze capitalism as contradictory value production or to claim that profit rates tended to fall in the long run or that, uh, uh, that, that, that they did not say certain things. For example, that capitalism was contradictory and suffered from crisis generating demand deficits when in fact Marx insist insisted on little else in capital. Such Western Marxists swagger as impossibly radical Marxists in the academy today while actually performing the impossible service to the, sorry, the invaluable service to the establishment of being avowed Marxists who declared that Marx and Engels were either wrong or irrelevant. The relevance of the manifesto can only become clear if we abandon the path of compromise with capitalism and imperialism, trodden by Western Marxism, and strike out along the path blazed by those who actually made revolutions and confronted the real world dilemmas. These people recast themselves as communists. These people and these forces recast themselves as communists to put clear blue water between themselves and uh, the Western Marxist path. This communist path is one along which the International Manifesto Group travels. It is also winning more and more converts from those who are confronting the dead ends of Western Marxism. Specifically, with regard to the Communist Manifesto, we see at least three major distortions. First of all, there is the lionization of capitalism, based on cherry-picking certain passages from Chapter 1, where Marx and Engels describe how capitalism has sharpened the class struggle to an historically unprecedented extent, and then go on to talk about the most revolutionary part that the bourgeoisie has played in this transformation. And there we read passages such as these, the bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, and idyllic relations, etc. That the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instrument of production. That, um, that all fixed and fast frozen relations with the ancient trains of venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away, etc. All that is solid melts into air, etc. From such passages, Western Marx construct not a Marx interpretation of it, but a Schumpeterian interpretation in which capitalism is capable of infinite development of the productive capacity of human social labor, undeterred by its contradictions. The, this Schumpeterian interpretation attributes the prosperity of the homelands of capitalism to capitalism's allegedly prodigious productivity while observing an omerta on the imperialism which has made such a critical contribution contribution to the prosperity of the West. So, uh, the second distortion, which is, re uh, is the related dismissal of the immiseration thesis. The numerous references to the misery of the proletariat in the manifesto is supposed on the one hand to be attributed only to the technological advances of a Promethean capitalism and not to the predatory and extractive operations of imperialism. They are also supposed to have uh, nullified, they have been nullified given the relative prosperity of the proletariat in the homelands of capitalism, particularly after the Second World War, ignoring the misery to into which working people around the world are thrown to this day. Uh, 
While the immiseration thesis is dismissed by refusing to see capitalism's worldwide, that is to say imperial reach, the same reach is recognized by Western Marxists to proclaim Marx and Engels as the original or ur theorists of globalization, peddling an understanding of the capitalist world as seamlessly unified by markets in which national states, boundaries and economies don't matter. But beyond the favorite passages of the Western Marxists, the Communist Manifesto itself, not to speak of the rest of Marx and Engels' vast oeuvre, contained plenty that underlines the centrality of the nation state and imperialism to capitalism. And, and how also underlined that anti-imperialism is critical to the unfolding of capitalism. We have passages such as uh, where Marx and Engels describe how capitalism requires political centralization, where independent but loosely connected provinces with separate interest laws, governments, and systems of taxation become lumped together into one nation with one government, one code of laws, one national interest, one frontier, one customs tariff. We read about how, though not in substance yet in form, the struggle of the proletariat with the bourgeoisie is at first a national struggle. The proletariat of each country must, of course, first of all, settle matters with its own bourgeoisie. We read about how the bourgeoisie finds itself in constant battle, not only with the aristocracy or with other sections of the bourgeoisie, but all the time with the bourgeoisie of foreign countries. We read how the proletariat must first of all acquire political supremacy, must rise to be the leading class of the nation, must constitute itself as the nation, etc. And finally, we read about how in proportion as the exploitation of one individual by another will also be put an end to, the exploitation of one nation by another will also be put an end to. In proportion as the antagonism between classes within nations vanishes, the hostility of one nation to another that will come to an end. So in conclusion, let me say that it is true, of course, as Marx and Engels so famously said that philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. But I think they would agree that revolutionaries cannot change the world unless they interpret it fairly accurately. That is why it is critical to read the manifesto without the distorting lenses that abound around us. And by looking at it through the lenses of actually occurring revolutions against capitalism and what is inseparable from it, imperialism, on the ultimate testing ground of any theory, and that is history. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and ones like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.